two, two announcements before I introduce tonight's lecture. On Monday, November 21st, uh, at 8 p.m., there'll be a special lecture by Luigi Pellegrini of Rome, Italy. And on the following day, November 22nd, at the same time, 8 p.m., will be a second lecture, uh, a special lecture by Hiroshi Watanabe of Tokyo. Rem Kuhas was born in Rotterdam, first uh, a film script writer, and then he went on to study architecture at the Architectural Association in London. Uh, he moved to New York in 1972, where he was a visiting fellow at the Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies. Since then, he has distinguished himself through a number of activities. As a writer, he's contributed to journal Oppositions, uh, the magazine, Architectural Design and is the author of the book Delirious New York, a Retroactive Manifesto for Manhattan. As a teacher, he was responsible along with Ilya Zengelis for establishing Unit 9 at the AA, a design studio which sought to develop a form of urbanism appropriate to the latter part of the 20th century. As an architect, he's received international recognition uh, first in 1975 for a house in Miami that he designed with Lorenda Speer, uh, later as a founder and partner in the Office for Metropolitan Architecture, and most recently for his entry in the Park La Villette competition. Tonight's lecture is about recent experiences of the Office in Socialist France, Rem Koolhaas. Uh, when I came uh, to New York on my way to Los Angeles, I was warned uh, about this audience. Uh, it was described as a hairy legs audience, uh, which had a very low tolerance for uh, any intellectual discourse. And I was, uh, and I was uh, warned to be uh, at all costs uh, extremely entertaining and uh, frivolous and to, at, and, and to maintain a certain momentum in a very fast uh, pace. Uh, but I... But, but I have to warn you that uh, uh, um, if I have once been able to do that kind of thing, I'm no, no longer able to do this, uh, this kind of work. And uh, this uh, change has, has occurred uh, by the simple fact that uh, I don't do my own architecture anymore, but I do other people's architecture. Now, and specifically what I want to talk about uh, tonight is uh, three experiences we had recently in this uh, past year in dealing with the uh, uh, new government, uh, with the socialist government uh, of France. And uh, I take the liberty, to, in spite of all these warnings, to explain to you kind of very precisely and very uh, uh, thoroughly the, the whole circumstances under which this work uh, came about, because I think they are important uh, to know, and I think it's even important that American audiences uh, 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 know about them and, and learn about the certain aspects of the present European condition. Can I have the first? Uh, first I want to show some a few uh, slides kind of uh, really explaining uh, what we've been doing. Uh, I lived in New York till essentially 78. In 78 I moved back to Europe. Um, we have an office in London, but this office has two branches, one in, M one in Rotterdam and one in Athens. And uh, in 1980 we got a major commission in Amsterdam to do a housing project uh, opposite the center of Amsterdam for 1,400 uh, units of, of dwelling. So for me, that was an extremely, um, of social housing, for me, that was an extremely good uh, uh, opportunity to live down my past, uh, where once I had been uh, kind of a very theoretical uh, architect interested in uh, some of the most extreme manifestations of the 20th century architecture, specifically Manhattan, I suddenly found myself forced to uh, deal with the, the kind of classical European subject, namely low-rise socialist housing. So I don't want to say much about it except to say that the portrait is almost finished uh, and that it can be seen in Amsterdam by anybody who visits the city. 
Uh, the other project we're working on is uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the other project we're working on is uh, uh, um, uh, in a way architecturally more interesting because it is a, a theater for a dance company, the Netherlands Dance Company, which performs a lot uh, in New York and I think also from time to time uh, across America. And it is a very bizarre project because it is a project that, that uh, which you see on the left, uh, the rectangle, that had to be built against an existing theater that was circular. And it had a very low budget and things like that, but you'll see in the slides maybe some of the I don't want to kind of explain too much about this one either, just to say that this is the kind of work we have been recently uh, involved in. Anyway, uh, in, in, uh, in, in the beginning of this year, uh, the French uh, government uh, organized uh, a competition uh, for uh, uh, a park in Paris. It was, they considered it themselves uh, a very important uh, competition and as a, a symptom of that uh, the French Minister of Culture, a certain Jacques Lang, uh, wrote, uh, uh, had his typist type out hand typed letters signed by him inviting uh, specific architects to participate because uh, Jacques Lang thought that the work uh, gave reason to expect uh, contributions to the emerging socialist culture of France. Uh, of course, everybody was very flattered uh, by, by such letters. What was uh, original about them was that there was no financial incentive. And, uh, and what was also, uh, I think, uh, very original and, and ultimately very stimulating was that the Minister of Culture would take the trouble to uh, address individual architects and to enlist their support in the enterprise that this, uh, a new regime had, uh, had embarked on at, at that time. It was a very ambitious enterprise that, that uh, was uh, really uh, embodied in not only in this competition but in a series of uh, three major competitions and two major enterprises which essentially was to transform Paris uh, in a socialist manner, or to establish in the city of Paris a series of uh, very strongly socialist uh, architectural projects. And I have to kind of really explain in detail what they were and where they were. Uh, the city of Paris, uh, you, you probably all know it, it, it is traversed by the uh, River Seine. Uh, it is a very dense city, so it is very difficult to find uh, sites there. Uh, where projects can be built. But anyway, one such site was this one, which had been uh, uh, the site of, uh, of slaughterhouses that had moved out of the city, so it was a kind of enormous uh, site, uh, more than a mile long and more than three quarters mile uh, wide, that was uh, more or less empty, on which the city was going to build what they called, or the state was going to build what they called the, the park for the 21st century. There were two other sites, on which they were going to build an even more ambitious uh, enterprise. Namely, uh, one side is here and the other side is here. Uh, a new uh, a World's Fair to celebrate the, uh, the 200th year anniversary of the French Revolution. So already in a kind of ring encircling Paris, there were going to be three major projects. The fourth one was uh, a new French opera on the wedge uh, shaped site here near the Bastille. The Bastille is also in the French revolutionary context an important point in Paris. And the fourth one was uh, somewhere here on axis with the Arc de Triomphe, uh, a new uh, core or a new focus for the uh, notorious La Défense uh, uh, project, uh, kind of a business center of Paris. So what the concept was, was to implant on a series of very loaded, already charged uh, sites, kind of the new outpost of the French socialist culture. Uh, the, the whole enterprise was not only original in a political sense, in, a, in the sense that a regime openly asked uh, the support of architects to, uh, in a way, represent them or help to define what the ambitions were, but it was also uh, important that in the face of the worst economic condition uh, of Europe, uh, there was certainly, here was certainly one regime 
that uh, embarked on a really phenomenal uh, amount of building activity, or at least thought it embarked on an enormous amount of uh, uh, building activity, seemingly without any regard for uh, economic realities. And, and as we will see in the course of the year, that became a very uh, difficult uh, complication of the whole enterprise. Here you see again the site of Paris with, with implanted on there the, the site for the World's Fair and the site for the park. It is uh, an interesting site because, as you know, Paris uh, is uh, a very a traditional European city. Uh, it had a series of uh, fortifications that encircled the whole city. The fortifications were taken down in the last century and instead there was built an enormous uh, circular superhighway, the so-called Périphérique which uh, in a way is a very interesting phenomenon because it injects in the whole urban uh, urbanism of Paris uh, uh, an American movement of perpetual motion on this perpetually congested uh, 10, 12 lane highway that traverses, uh, the, the this, that encircles the city, that almost uh, kind of imprisons the city in this kind of belt of modernity. Uh, what is interesting is that the one uh, uh, real uh, phenomenon of modernity of the 20th century that Paris knows, this, this loop, uh, is very unpopular and that no architect or no uh, urbanist has yet tried to find uh, uh, a way of exploiting uh, its presence. Whenever it's discussed, it's always discussed in terms of how its impact can be minimized and how the damage of it can be undone. And in the current, uh, in the last 10 years, that has been in general the uh, tone of the architectural debate in Europe, how the whole damage of the modern age can be pushed back, undone, neglected, ignored, and how Europe can resume some kind of uh, Id idyllic uh, historical uh, uh, model. But what was interesting in the time of this competition was that this tendency, the, the kind of historicist tendency of Europe, coincided more or less with the emergence of the uh, new French government. And uh, in the first two years of its life, there was a very intense debate uh, of architects, some of them modern, some of them leaning in the kind of historicist uh, direction for the ear of this government, both of them trying to enlist the government in, in their own specific uh, pursuits. So what was interesting after these three years, when the competition for La Villette was organized, that at that point the French government, the new socialist regime, was officially committed to modern architecture, and therefore that was the reason that they asked for a park, not of the 20th century, leave alone the 19th century, but officially for the 21st uh, century. So for us that seemed a very uh, good omen, to, uh, uh, and it was definitely a reason to participate. Uh, because the site is uh, on the edge of, of traditional Paris, it, it faces two conditions. On the south of it, there's the solid Paris uh, of blocks, and on, on the north, there's a kind of suburban plankton that has no uh, shape. And, uh, and, 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 the, and it's, uh, so on the one hand, it has a kind of traditional uh, definition, and on the north, the tradition is given by the highway on this uh, scattered uh, fabric. Is it possible to uh, switch off that uh, light because it's uh, almost blinding? Thank you. Um, here, you close up, here you see a close-up of the side. Uh, in, in the state it, in which it was uh, delivered, here the, the traditional pairs with a, a beautiful park uh, of the 19th century, the Butte Chaumont, a very nice romantic uh, English uh, French enclave and here you see the, the scale of the whole operation kind of compared to the uh, texture of Paris as we know it. You also see two uh, ominous rectangles uh, that you will come across more uh, in the course of this uh, whole lecture. Because the site was not uh, given completely uh, handed up completely empty but what you see here is an arrow photograph of the site but here the, the original slaughterhouses as they were built in the 19th century and here, a new, hyper-modern slaughterhouse, abattoir, that was constructed in the early 70s to replace the old uh, houses. 
But then uh, one of the typical kind of state uh, confusions emerged because as soon as the modern slaughterhouse, slaughterhouse was completely finished, the state decided not to uh, maintain it, not to use it, to, that Paris couldn't take the kind of influx of the amount of traffic the slaughterhouse would cause. So therefore they decided to, uh, to take the slaughterhouse and to, to build a new one uh, outside Paris. So at this point, the site was completely confused. There was the old slaughterhouses that were going to go and new slaughterhouses that were going to replace them, but that they had themselves been replaced by a newer one. And in the meantime, the whole ideology of, of taking out old buildings had collapsed and now it became essential in the country to maintain every old building that the city ever had. So uh, uh, it became very difficult to kind of uh, to, to rethink what would happen uh, in this situation. It was a very difficult ideological problem. And the compromise that was uh, struck was to leave on the side one of the big halls, one of the old slaughterhouses, and to uh, convert this hypermodern uh, slaughterhouse uh, into a museum of science. So, um, so, so already, I mean, the, the kind of history of this uh, site was extremely uh, uh, dense with all kinds of uh, very uh, complicated, complex ideological issues that, that made uh, the, the program both very difficult and very exciting. Because in other words, it meant that there had to be a park, but embedded in this park, there were already, already two enormous and, and really monolithic uh, volumes of a scale that, is, that was almost American in its uh, blandness uh, and enormity. Uh, here you see some of the conditions of the site. I mentioned the, the highway and the edge of the highway that is a, a beautiful curve that runs on the site. Then there was a drop and the site was really barren terrain. There was a river running, uh, uh, or a canal running through the center of the site. It had a beautiful bridge. It was one of the uh, few, let's say, really historical elements uh, present on the site, and that had to be uh, kept as well. And a strange, surreal enclave of a, of a classical park, uh, marooned in the middle of nowhere. Here you see some of the, uh, the skyline, the kind of typical late century, late 20th century plankton skyline. And then you see the two objects, the hall uh, of the old slaughterhouse, and here the Museum of Science in the state of Republic. Uh, again, typical for the European confusion where, where now even the most ugly things are kept because they're more than 100 years old, uh, uh, displaying an almost American uh, uh, anxiety about uh, history. Uh, uh, where this building was uh, uh, really uh, in my view of, of no uh, architectural merit that nevertheless had to be kept at enormous cost. And the other building, in fact it was a rather gloomy and depressing building, as befits uh, Slotown. And the other building was even uh, gloomy and, and even more uh, incomprehensible, uh, an enormous uh, series of pylons with colossal space frame uh, defining it which was in the, for, uh, in, in the process of conversion. It was very clear that uh, the French state took at the highest level an enormous uh, interest in this whole enterprise, the conversion of Paris, uh, and it was rumored uh, that President, uh, President Mitterrand himself had taken it uh, upon his shoulders to make sure that this enterprise would be crowned with success. Uh, one of uh, his uh, earlier interventions showing the kind of still ambiguous nature of the relationship between the architects and political power was uh, this model of the final version of the Museum of Science that uh, uh, also contained a spherical auditorium that was built in such a way that the president himself could, by moving a certain drawer in the model, uh, himself uh, establish the, diff the distance between the museum and the sphere. So in a kind of well-publicized uh, ceremony, the, museum, the president was invited to, uh, to inspect the model and invited himself personally to manipulate, to manipulate the door and to, uh, to exclaim at the moment uh, that the uh, perfect distance had been uh, discovered, that uh, it had to be uh, frozen uh, at this distance. So, 
so that was one of the details that we were aware of and that uh, filled us uh, with a certain foreboding but uh, nevertheless nevertheless was could also be interpreted as a sign of interest in architecture uh, our first uh, instinct uh, as it has always been in in complicated uh, circumstances was to see it was to simply get a kind of the drift of the uh, um, enormity of the site the, the, the its size its uh, its potential by simply projecting a series of existing uh, architectural projects uh, on it to to see what what effects it would have this was uh, Mises IIT campus uh, transplanted prayers uh, a series of con uh, constructivist uh, projects uh, collaged to uh, on the same scale here too. So, in, uh, in other words, uh, we first uh, tried to grasp the, the potential of the whole operation by simply projecting and transplanting uh, other 20th century things kind of on the side to, to see what it meant. And then we went through a really agonizing uh, period uh, of trying to design a park or to design something nice uh, for the site. And uh, I have to kind of explain some a little bit more about the background. The, the project was uh, the competition was organized in August um, uh, 82. The deadline was uh, end of November 82. And for the first three months, we went uh, through this real agony of trying to design at this scale without really the, an instrument or the kind of conceptual framework or any, let's say, depth of understanding of what the whole comp uh, problem was about. Uh, in other words, letting loose our traditional architecture reflexes of designing a project. And it was only uh, in retrospect that we discovered that that was a terrible mistake, but that apparently we, we needed to undergo this kind of humiliation of not being able to design something and, not, and, and being uh, forced to produce one really monstrous cartoon after another, that we, uh, that we uh, kind of stepped back and, and gave ourselves uh, an opportunity to really think about, uh, to, to, let's say, to step uh, aside from this process, this horrible compulsion of designing, and to start uh, actually to think. So, and, and, uh, when we think, uh, uh, we, we have noticed also another project that, uh, that uh, the, the really in architecture uh, uh, abused uh, science of mathematics uh, in, in certain cases provides extremely inspiring uh, answers. And we started to really uh, study the problem because it turned out that, that really the park was not going to be a park uh, at all. It was something totally different it, because the, its program was really huge and, and enormous. And it contained this amount in graphic terms. I mean, in other words, this, the white piece is the side, and the program that was asked to be put on the side, which was not park, in other words, all uh, programmatic components that were not park, were almost as much as the whole site uh, itself. So only when we kind of started uh, uh, representing the issue in this graphic form did we discover that the French state called for a park. But in this park, they wanted so much accommodation, so many things, so many events, so many other uh, uh, architectural items that there was a very strong tension and contradiction with the whole idea of having a park. They really wanted two things on the same place. And we only discovered it once we started doing this kind of uh, research, where this amount had to be built, built projects, this amount had to be sheltered, and this amount was open air activities, but nevertheless, all were denominated and had, were had kind of square meters uh, added to them. It was an enormous array of educational gardens, uh, scientific gardens, uh, uh, research gardens, uh, th thematic gardens, uh, exotic gardens. Uh, uh, there were, were, were to be gardens in which the whole uh, surrounding neighborhood could indulge in some of the most uh, modern media uh, of the 21st century, there were experimental gardens, there, were, there was a scientific dimension, there was a cybernetic dimension, there were computer gardens. In other words, uh, in, its, uh, in, its, uh, first, uh, uh, in its first wave of enthusiasm about what the contents 
of this uh, new socialist culture could be, there would have been a kind of incredible uh, uh, development of an incredible ambition, where in a way the whole concept of a park uh, creaked under the load of other and further uh, impositions. And it was only when we started to, dis to discover kind of those, this kind of logic that we managed to begin to find a way out of the thing. So here we, we distributed everything that had name in the program that was not park and not garden in this, uh, in this uh, fashion to simply to, to get a, an idea of the enormous size of the thing. Uh, when we did, when we were this far, we became uh, even more enthusiastic about the whole uh, enterprise because we, for ourselves, thought that it became possible uh, in this project to uh, try to evade one of the uh, most negative, at least for us, aspects of the current ar architectural situation, where just as we had started our, our whole enterprise by immediately designing a park and by immediately uh, indulging in this artistic uh, response, uh, uh, we were uh, falling into a trap. In the same way, we thought that by really doing this park in a kind of what we thought was new and relatively original way, we could avoid the, this incredible uh, compulsion of the uh, architectural 70s and 80s of making objects, making icons, making things, making buildings, making architecture, making history, without any regard for contents or any regards for uh, other uh, uh, reasons for architecture such as program, such as culture, and, uh, and without any thought about the way uh, architecture doesn't really not only embody itself or is itself, but also embodies kind of and, and constraints and makes possible at the same time uh, uh, other cultural events. So in many ways, the project was for us uh, an attempt to, uh, to establish in Europe uh, theories that we, or uh, apply in Europe theories or, or discoveries that we had made in America, for which this one is still the most emblematic for me uh, after all these years, where, uh, we, uh, where I defined uh, in the book Delirious New York the importance of architecture not as form making, but as kind of the organization of certain programmatic com components in such a way that new cultural phenomena become possible. Because here, uh, 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 ostensibly a very uh, boring uh, floor, a uh, plan in a uh, boring building, if we kind of read what, what the programmatic components are, we see a locker room, it's an athletic building in New, in New York, we see a locker room, a boxing, a wrestling, so there's a kind of scenario inscribed in this plan where a Wall Street businessman kind of emerges from the elevator, undresses, put some boxing gloves, but then we see that the same uh, room is also served by an oyster bar. So that, uh, so that uh, if you kind of disregard the uh, architectural poverty of, uh, of this plan, you could say it embodies and contains a very exciting architectural scenario, which is easting or oysters with boxing gloves naked uh, on, the ninth, on, the, uh, on the ninth floor. Uh, and, it was, uh, and it was kind of our uh, intention and our ambition, uh, in a way, to try to uh, investigate to what extent that kind of architecture, which really had much more to do with plotting certain uh, events and making certain, triggering certain events, rather than to uh, design nice forms, how uh, such a kind of form of architecture, uh, uh, how it was possible to uh, investigate and establish that uh, uh, ourselves at this point in time. Uh, another, uh, let's say, kind of model of what, uh, what we were interested in was uh, uh, the creation of uh, new combinations. And I think this is a very uh, telling uh, example. I think it's also for Los Angeles. If you're interested in love, in trains, and in movies, there is no reason, even though everybody would kind of usually claim that there was, the not to enjoy the, the this to indulge the interest in these uh, three things at one and the same time, uh, such as can be kind of done in this uh, <laughs> uh, in this uh, uh, amazing image, and uh, and so so we had uh, an intuition that uh, 
uh, through, its, uh, through its amazing abundance and through its amazing overload uh, of, of, of demands and ambitions and through uh, its almost ridiculous way in which it was asking too many things, this program uh, for the park could be organized in the same way so that the kind of simultaneity uh, and the superimposition of all these activities could trigger new, uh, new density uh, of experience that, that was uh, caused through the organization rather than new forms. <coughs> well, I mean, this is in a, this, uh, in a way a kind of model of, of, of the way we were thinking of what this part would be. Uh, another uh, a long-standing kind of obsession that uh, uh, we have had and, and that I've had in particular is the uh, the poetics uh, one could say or the uh, the nature of the event that happens every time two different conditions uh, meet and I think all of you know the kind of the, the self-evident truth that where two conditions meet a, a third condition is generated that has as elements of both but that uh, nevertheless uh, has its own originality. The beach is one of the uh, most evident uh, examples. A beach offering kind of uh, the sheer pleasure of the meeting of these two elements in an almost abstract way that is nevertheless uh, obvious to almost everybody. Uh, this was an uh, early example of in our own work. But it also is uh, true that the same thing happens on the scale uh, of urbanism, uh, such as uh, in the case of the Berlin Wall. Uh, which I studied uh, before I came to America as, a, as an urbanistic uh, phenomenon, where it was also clear that the kind of simple presence of the wall caused an enormous tension, kind of uh, an architectural tension between two conditions that were very close and generated a whole subculture along the wall of special events and special possibilities. And even though in this case they were totally negative, it wasn't uh, too difficult to conceive uh, a way in which this, this border condition could be exploited as a, uh, as a positive uh, phenomenon. So then we go kind of finally to the first uh, really sane uh, kind of uh, stage of, of the competition for La Villette, where we simply thought, okay, uh, we stop designing a kind of very nice uh, part, we stop designing in fact, but from now on we take a series of very logical steps and we try to organize the thing kind of according to uh, these kind of ambitions and claims that are kind of indicated. The first thing we do is we divide the whole program and every programmatic uh, component into very narrow bands and we organize the narrow bands kind of across the side in north-south direction in such a way that they're always very thin and so that, they're always, uh, it, that it is always very evident that one condition or one programmatic uh, component uh, borders on the next one so that just like a beach there's always a kind of in-between zone where a third unpredictable e event uh, takes place and then we distribute these bands across the site in a more or less random condition which has the further advantage that if a sp let's say a given activity A is organized in this way and a, give it a given activity B is organized in that way it is possible in a linear way to indulge in activity B for a long time and to get lost literally in activity B but if you are bored by activity B you can always escape very easily to A or C and in the meantime between A and B there is a kind of crossover of the two conditions A B so in that really mathematical way we thought that we could kind of distribute all the activities uh, across the site in a way that through the organization alone a kind of very intense uh, experience could be uh, 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 could be organized or could be uh, generated. So here there were kind of let's say the first uh, examples of of that way where let's say a, a strip of sports would adjoin a strip of uh, tropical gardens, would adjoin a, a strip of swimming pools, would adjoin a strip of theaters, etc., etc. So this was uh, essentially the first, and I still think the, the let's say the most important step. For the uh, for attacking this uh, incredibly complex uh, program, after our despair to be able to organize it uh, through the sheer act of design. But then there uh, emerged uh, in the sketches uh, after the the kind of essential process of layering the whole program across the site, 
uh, uh, an, another kind of type of activity which could not really be very distributed uh, in a belt or in a band, but that had a kind of more uh, a specific point-like uh, character. I mean, it, it was not an activity, but it, there might be kind of a series of, of places that had to be organized. So we, we became aware that, that certain activities could not be organized uh, in this fashion and needed a really another kind of logic uh, which had to do more with points and here we see kind of an, another kind of, of those sketch where we see that uh, apart from bands there's emerging a kind of generation of uh, a point grid so to speak and then we uh, we analyzed the program in such a uh, and, and, and pulled out from the kind of first organization a series of other elements that we uh, decided to organize in a different way elements such as kiosks greenhouses, uh, tea rooms, picnic places, uh, play areas, things that f of which it was very important that they were distributed equally uh, across the site and available in equal extent in the different uh, conditions. So here you see, let's say, a graph of the desirable interval of all those uh, yeah. elements. And then we even went kind of further uh, and, and decided to really do the whole thing kind of mathematically and to uh, devise a formula where the interval between these uh, facilities would be established by taking the, the whole area of the park, uh, deducting from it the area of the element required and dividing it by the number of points we wanted to consider. I have to confess here also that, that once we, that the moment that we introduced our first mathematical formula in a work of a moment of incredible liberation uh, uh, for ourselves and also uh, 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 because it also connected us with a whole series of uh, architectural researches that had been done in the 60s when I was a student, I started studying in 68 when people like uh, Cedric Price, Kevin uh, Lynch and others started to develop uh, uh, ways of thinking that had, had to, a lot to do with this kind of planning, uh, abstract, mathematical uh, formulae. And of course in the 70s everybody had been rejecting them, so it was for us a, an enormous pleasure to, uh, in a way, uh, profit uh, and, uh, from this uh, neglect and to try to uh, reconquer or regain this uh, kind of architecture uh, uh, again for the 80s, to, to, uh, in other words, and, and uh, I even uh, uh, developed a theory about it, that the most recent additions to the slack heap of architectural history are always uh, extremely rich in content and are always rejected for purely stylistic reasons. In other words, uh, if you ignore the style and if you simply look at the contents, there is an enormous, uh, enormously rich harvest of recently forgotten architectural theories that anybody could benefit from. Anyway, so in this mathematical way, we, distri we distributed the, the kind of main ingredients of the, uh, of the uh, special facilities, such as the, the kiosks or the coffee shops, the, uh, the, the kiosks, the playgrounds, the, lar the small picnic areas, and the large so, so really what we devised is a series, a whole generation of small buildings, that buildings, smaller buildings, uh, that ranged from the very small to the uh, fairly big, for, and established a different uh, interval for each uh, one of them, in such a way that kind of superimposed and kind of all accumulated together, they would pull the whole side uh, together. Also because all the, all the grids were in themselves uh, different, there would be always kind of different connections and different proximities between the different elements of the point grids. And also because the, the elements of the point grids would always fall in different belts of the uh, programmatic belts of the first uh, organization. It was possible through these two very simple steps to ensure that every uh, part of the whole site was in a kind of fundamental sense very different from every other uh, uh, part of the site simply because the program had been generated uh, in this way.
Well, the first, the, the third step was after we had kind of organized the thing in this manner to um, uh, to uh, to make sure that there would be a kind of circulation within the park that could benefit uh, from this uh, from this organization, and we soon felt that there was one kind of essential step to take, which was that there would be one major circulation axis, which we later called the boulevard, that went at right angles through all the belts, giving direct access to uh, all the activities. And then we researched into a kind of a secondary system that was more picturesque, where the kind of random combinations that were generated uh, through the first organization could be exploited in, in different patterns and by different uh, by different uh, forms of circulation. So it w became a kind of superimposition of the formal and the kind of relentlessly uh, informal that was superimposed on it. So there was always this path, but then there was a kind of series of secondary paths that would weave across the uh, site, kind of verging or, or going from kind of one intense point in the whole uh, scheme to another. So this is wha what it finally became. Then when we had done those kind of, uh, when, when we had arranged those kind of systems, uh, it, it became clear that uh, beyond the systems, there was always another, also another issue that we had to face, which was the issue of the existing elements. So what we had done was to organize the major part of the program in such a way that we were sure that there would be, let's say, a cybernetic uh, field on which a whole series of programmatic, unforeseeable programmatic possibilities became possible. But then we were still stuck on this field with these major elements, such as the Museum of Science and this uh, former slaughterhouse. So we decided that it became necessary to uh, add to these two, in a way to incorporate them into a larger composition, additional elements that would finally make up the park, and that elements that represented the whole idea of a park, which became kind of most uh, strongly embodied in an element which we called the round forest, and later, as we will see, a second element which we call the linear forest. So that just as, as there were marooned on the side, this colossal hole and this hole, there would be two uh, uh, strong uh, tectonic elements, although they were not architecture, that would counteract these architectonic forms with nature of the same intensity and that would, let's say, complete the whole composition, uh, architectural composition of the park. This became the kind of uh, the circular forest, of which I will kind of talk uh, more later, but which was simply kind of a, a so-called with a kind of group of trees. But so here, then, we have a kind of, let's say a kind of a first uh, image of the kind of total result of all these uh, five superimpositions. You recognize the belts. You see that the belts kind of are aligned with the canal, so that the canal, which already exists, is one of the first of the belts. You see the, the point grids, which we later called confetti, that distribute the facilities across the site. You see the forms of circulation, and then you see the major nature elements that turn the whole thing into a park. So after, so in, uh, in, in November, after kind of devising uh, all these ways, we made this one drawing that uh, in the end became uh, our the major part of our submission, which consisted of where we really claimed and where we wrote the report. Uh, we don't design a park because it is impossible to design a park at this stage. But what we have done is discovered that the program can be organized by six autonomous uh, projects or five autonomous projects, which we, uh, and the net results of this coexistence of all these autonomous projects finally yields the new park for the 21st uh, century. So this is the kind of drawing that we uh, submitted and that kind of obviously caused a kind of incredible uh, consternation uh, in, the, uh, in the jury because uh, it, wa it, it was seen as a kind of act of the most shameless defiance that we would present a park uh, in this uh, manner that looked like the diagram for a kind of Jap Japanese uh, uh, television. But, uh, but but you still you still recognize you still recognize kind of the basic givens. There are the lines 
inscribed on the lines are the kind of thematic zones and the programmatic zones. The colored elements are the confetti or the, the facilities that are distributed on the point grids. And then the, the, there is the circulation. And then kind of finally the major elements that are superimposed on the whole works. Uh, there, became, there was, uh, again, an anecdote, uh, a tremendously uh, triumphant uh, uh, moment in uh, late December when the jury had met, uh, where uh, uh, I was called on uh, Sunday morning uh, by the Elysee Palace uh, in Paris, but I could come over to uh, Paris as quickly as possible to be introduced to the president on Monday morning. Uh, with a kind of added uh, notation that uh, it had to do with the competition uh, for La Villette. And two years later, uh, two hours later, I was called uh, by, again by the Elysee Palace, uh, saying that uh, after all, it wasn't necessary to be really that early in Paris the next morning, that it was okay uh, to come at two o'clock. Then in the same morning, I, I got phone calls from other uh, architects across the world, one of them, uh, Bernard Chumi, who had also uh, been invited for two o'clock. So uh, I could reconstruct uh, in retrospect that for two hours, uh, our project had been the only winners, but uh, in the intervening time, uh, as it turned out on that uh, Monday after, uh, there were nine first, uh, at the jury had kind of compromised. There had been an incredible fight uh, in the jury, and in the end they had decided to, uh, to invite nine winners they all won the first prize and they were invited to submit their, their uh, themes three months later in a more elaborated uh, version. Uh, it was very hilarious, uh, to the, the, the presentation itself was very hilarious because in a room almost ten times as big as this one, with uh, a screen uh, almost uh, as big as the uh, biggest one on, on the, as the Calvin Klein advertisement on the, uh, Times Square, there was uh, uh, a an, an, uh, kind of uh, a, a big uh, desk in which the jurors sat, uh, almost like the Soviet Politburo, with, uh, <laughs> uh, with very stony faces, and Jacques Lang, the Minister of Culture, uh, explaining each project, uh, pointing backwards, because he was uh, addressing uh, the audience. So, uh, uh, and for us, it was a really tremendous experience, because we saw every winning scheme was a mass of trees and, and incredibly nice drawings and, and full of uh, joy and full of kind of the traditional science of a park. And then our uh, drawing came, the whole uh, auditorium went black and Jacques Lang thought that uh, something had gone wrong and the auditorium kind of slowly bent out. <laughs> Looking. And, and, and then, uh, then explained uh, to the audience uh, that uh, uh, this scheme, uh, through its uh, rel relentless Cartesian logic, had uh, hopelessly entrapped the uh, French juries uh, uh, in, its, uh, in its intellectual discourse. Uh, so, so at that point, uh, uh, a new situation uh, uh, emerged. We were feeling uh, extremely optimistic. Uh, it looked as if we had the whole thing in the back. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I want to talk uh, a little bit more about this uh, drawing. Uh, you see it here in its, all its nakedness, but of course it really embodies or contains another drawing that we didn't submit, but which is the drawing of all the simultaneous activities that are possible, that were generated in this scheme. And of course, you, you see them here in a kind of series of sketches, you know, that, 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 that at all time were the, were the kind of the secret reservoir for which these kind of stylized versions uh, emerged. So in our park, one person could harvest and the next one could play golf. And here, and in this kind of particular re region that looked kind of eminently blank on the plan, uh, if it were rendered in terms of kind of human activity, it generated this uh, fresco. Which for us was, was the real important, uh, what's its really important part. And, and of course, uh, any competition involves uh, you directly in, in the whole issue of tactics. 
And so in uh, December 1982, it looked as if we had played our tactics well, uh, where we had kind of presented a document that was inscrutable, unreadable, incomprehensible, that had a very, uh, that had a very suggestive uh, text, a very logical text, and in which we had not kind of uh, put our cards uh, on the table uh, entirely. So then followed uh, a kind of very complicated uh, period because the jury was divided in two camps and that was also the reason that uh, we hand won outright. One, one half was landscape architects and the other half was real architects. <laughs> and uh, and, and uh, the, well, I hope that by now you, you will have understood that I'm not that uh, uh, fond of real architects. But, um, uh, and and the, the objections of the, of the landscape architects to our scheme had been quite widely in a way that it uh, was no landscape whatsoever. Uh, and and uh, on the other hand, the, the objections of all the uh, of the architects to against all the other schemes had been that they were only landscape and no thought and no architect no architecture no 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 culture in a way just just image and just form. So we were in a kind of very difficult position, namely what tactic to adopt for for the next uh, stage where we had to elaborate uh, our ideas, and of course we also had the ambition to, uh, apart from everything else that the scheme uh, embodied, to also make it into a park and to devise a way in which, in spite of all the other things that were going on in this project, we could also, uh, because exactly because we believed in the idea of simultaneity, because in the Lears New York, we had also tried to establish that the, the, the most critical, the most promising and the most creative aspect of the 20th century had been exactly its congestion of different elements on a given side, the incredible richness of the kind of the met metropolitan density, how it could be exploited, not by having one element here and another element there, but by juxtaposing and superimposing and compressing all these experiences in one. Mm -hmm. So in this second stage, we also developed the ambition to turn whatever else the project was to really turn it into a part. And for that, we uh, this is a, an early uh, uh, sketch where one of the things that uh, we uh, investigated is that as we had proved, uh, shown in the earlier version, that we didn't have any room to make a park, that what we could uh, nevertheless uh, have here was uh, uh, because there was no room to really have uh, uh, major areas of green, what we could do is to find kind of in the, in the uh, regions between the bands very narrow strips of green and here to concentrate the major effect of the green here along the canal and here where this uh, element had the advantage that it would block the enormous impact of the uh, Museum of Science where this what we call the circular forest had the uh, advantage of being a kind of real symbol of a forest and where we kind of thought that we could develop a, sim, uh, a system almost like a stage, where like a stage set that is kind of built up of a series of different wings, that if you see them in perspective, they uh, create the illusion of a whole uh, uh, or, and of a certain density, that what we could do was uh, devise a series of lines of trees, rows of trees, that if you stood here and if you, know, you move to the park, nevertheless, cumulatively, in the kind of collapsing, uh, collapsing effect, of a perspective would give the idea that the whole site was, ap apart from everything else it was, was also covered in a forest. So that became then the kind of second motif for the rest of the scheme, for, for the kind of elaboration of the scheme. Here you see it in its uh, kind of primitive form. where you also see that it has the added advantage of, of kind of ma making uh, the trajectory through the park more uh, unknowable and more surprising than it would be if the whole thing had remained flat. So what we tried to do is kind of make these screens that at the same time blocked and uh, together uh, co in a compressed way give an illusion of a forest. And we took that really very seriously because also we, we had become very interested in the possibilities of landscape architecture 
uh, uh, because we were doing the landscaping of our project in Amsterdam. But we decided not to do it in the usual picturesque way, but to use the landscaping to uh, have a kind of uh, to increase the didactic uh, uh, potential of the park. So we simply we didn't kind of simply make nice uh, rows of trees, but we tried to give every row a theme that uh, would uh, kind of have a dialectical relationship with the other ones, and that made the whole experience of the park, apart from picturesque experience, also. Uh, and kind of educational experience, which of course coincided with the whole uh, ambition of the French state at that moment. So, the way in which it was kind of finally uh, elaborated would be, for instance, that we had of one type uh, a maple tree. We would, for instance, have uh, a series of individuals, meaning that every tree would be very different from every other one, like the differences between uh, human beings. Then we would take a, another tree, a chestnut, and there we would have only clones, so that all the trees kind of would be completely identical. We also did the, the same thing. We would have kind of columnar trees, and other trees would be kind of like, let's say, droopy, like kind of weeping willows. We would have trees that were growing in different uh, seasons. We would have trees that were growing different kind of colors. So all in all, we developed a very intricate uh, uh, scheme where the relationship between every tree became kind of very strong simply through this alternation of, of different uh, themes and this kind of didactic elaboration of what was possible uh, with trees. Here you see that, for instance, on the outside of the park, there's a kind of billboard, there is a kind of like a, uh, uh, like a trailer of a movie, a kind of uh, anthology of all the par uh, trees that uh, were possible in the parks. Here there is a kind of technical zone where we would kind of uh, treat the kind of line with certain kind of mechanical apparatus uh, so that uh, uh, trees that wouldn't grow in France uh, suddenly grew in this direction. So in, in the same way, the whole thing was elaborated in a very uh, complex manner that we felt was the equivalent of the kind of other organization of the park. We took special uh, interest and special care with this uh, round forest because the round forest uh, became was a, was the, let's say the core of the experience of the park. Uh, it was, and what was very important about it is that, uh, and that was what was very important in the whole thing, was that we wanted to design a park that was enjoyable and that was impressive the moment it opened. So it was a, it had to be a park that wasn't uh, only. Uh, that wouldn't only kind of reach its maturity or its interest 100 years after it uh, was finished, but uh, it had to be a park that was immediately impressive and immediately recognizable as a park, if only because it had to feature in the president's uh, re-election campaign. Uh, so we took special care with, the, with this round park, which was built on a uh, round forest, which was built on a sokol, a podium, which was also equipped with the kind of picnic places and barbecue pits, and devised a scheme uh, of alternating cypresses and uh, cedars of the Lebanon, where um, we could kind of predict that in the year of the opening of the park, the two types of trees would be uh, roughly uh, identical in height and would, would have uh, like a kind of miniature uh, garden, like uh, Versailles, the famous parterres of uh, Versailles, but it, uh, where it would really be kind of a very geometrical arrangement, where uh, in the first 30 years of its existence, the cypress trees would grow much faster than the cedars of the Lebanon, but where uh, after uh, 30 years, the cedars of the Lebanon would start to outgrow the cypresses to finally form a kind of uh, a solid roof of uh, dark green over the cypresses that uh, through the very lack of light would kind of uh, uh, remain at a stable size. So in a way, we try to uh, use the kind of spectacle uh, of this uh, kind of race between two uh, types uh, as, a, uh, as a further reinforcement of the kind of dialectical and, and intellectual uh, aspect of the park. Then we made what was probably uh, the biggest uh, miscalculation in, in the whole uh, enterprise, because so far, we had to remain uh, very um, abstract and very, uh, let's say, theoretical. 
And then we, we felt that the only way to prove the kind of strength of our ideas was to make it to show uh, that we actually kind of could deliver the goods to build uh, one of the most complex models that I think have been built in uh, architecture in recent times to show to build the whole uh, uh, model of the park. So here you see the model of the circular forest uh, in its infancy, uh, when it really is kind of nothing but but a geometrical French garden, with, with as you see a marble strip with kind of barbecue places and picnic places. And here it would be uh, in its uh, more definitive form. So what I will show in the rest of the lecture is a series of slides of this uh, colossal model. Uh, it was, I think, uh, something like uh, 14 feet by 10 feet uh, and, and really went uh, into a degree of detail of the park. And I will explain kind of in this uh, whole thing the, and the connection between the circular and the linear force. And I will explain in this scheme uh, just a few of the strips how they were actually built. So here you see again the build-up of the model, which coincides with the build-up of the whole argument, where first the ground is divided in this kind of abstract composition, almost a painting, but not a painting of colors, but a painting of kind of the different activities that are inscribed on the whole uh, plane. Then superimposed on that some of the major elements, the bridge, the linear forest, the round forest, Do you see the kind of glimpse in And here you see the model in its kind of final. And I just want to kind of, in a way, take a tour uh, of the model. You see, here is the boulevard, the, the one that, that cuts right across all the strips. Here is one, one of the strips that we kind of elaborated that also gives you an idea of the kind of ambition uh, the cultural ambition of the French, uh, uh, we call it the media strip, which was uh, a zone where all the media that were accessible to the immediate neighborhoods were concentrated at a radio station, video workshops, etc., etc. So here you can also see how the scheme worked in terms of being dense and kind of linear in this direction and being very transparent in this direction. So this what I will show this one in detail. I will also show this strip that is a series of sports strip also in detail, and then kind of generally take you to the park. So this, this as I already explained, this is how it looked uh, in the plan. Uh, still uh, very enigmatic and therefore promising. And here you, you see the thing kind of in, uh, in its final form uh, in the model. It also had to contain a series of sets that were uh, usable for the different for the surrounding communities where different uh, conditions in nature were represented. So we had in the middle of the real nature of the trees, the possibilities of a series of kind of Hollywood uh, universal studio, but a very thin universal studio that didn't interfere uh, with the rest of the existence of the park. So here you see the synthetic park, let's say, intersecting the real park uh, at night. What was uh, very uh, illuminating for us to uh, uh, learn through this experience was how on a scale like this one, it is very possible to do an architecture that is very programmatic, that retains uh, seen from above a very abstract uh, uh, quality, but that seen from the ground has all the kind of familiar aspects of uh, recognizable, let's say, vegetal, park-like, reality. So, th so that was a very exciting thing for us to, to experiment with, that on seen from above it was all program and seen from the ground it was all green. And it is that kind of discrepancy that we try to exploit to the minimum, to the maximum. So there was a second, uh, uh, another strip that contained all the kind of sports facilities that also included the mountain, a series of tennis courts, basketball uh, courts, volleyball courts, running tracks, but that were also in a, arranged in a very thin belt, always adjoining uh, different conditions, such as in this case, a series of agricultural gardens where experimental types of grain were growing. 
So here you see kind of the real ambition of the, the French. There was a, a linear park of a real park, an experimental laboratory for different kinds of grains, a sports strip, and then next to, to that, uh, another kind of strip again. And then the kind of tension of this edge condition between the different Uh, uh, we were stuck uh, not only with this, uh, with this enormous museum, but also with the uh, sphere that Mitterrand had pulled very far uh, into the park. Uh, we somehow had to incorporate, uh, incorporate it. Uh, the program also asked for an astronomical garden where uh, there had to be a, a series of... Uh, where the movement of the heavenly bodies had to be represented. So we decided to declare that sphere Saturn and to uh, uh, establish a line with cables where all the other uh, heavenly bodies would move uh, according to the kind of allotted uh, line. So, so that became another kind of line, another superimposition, another band of the park. Then along the canal, uh, and, and for us, uh, again, uh, what I emphasize is the kind of the, uh, the way in which these elements can coexist in a single uh, park, and, and what I consider the virtue of the park, where on one belt you have a kind of totally synthetic world of this astronomical garden, and less than uh, 50 feet next to it there's a park which really has, uh, alongside the canal, which you see there, which really has a series of almost traditional French uh, river landscapes. And I think it's, it's in images uh, like this one that I, uh, that I feel we came close to realizing something about this ambition of being all things uh, at the same time. So a, a project that is all program, but also a project that is in a very real sense, also a park, even if it's only the illusion of a park, built up of a series of screens of uh, trees and nothing more. Whenever uh, one of the point grids intersected with a major element, it became uh, uh, translated. So here we have a kiosk in a linear forest which becomes a little stage and a kind of primitive hut. And then here you see more close-ups of those kind of lonely little elements that, that ensure that at every point in the park certain services uh, are available. The park at night, which, which of course in itself became a kind of reinforcement uh, of the possible illusions because of all the wings and of all the, the screens of trees, you could emphasize certain ones, delete others, and, you, uh, and it became kind of a possibility of redesigning at night the whole experience of the park, which was also very important because, of course, this is one of the only uh, real sites in Europe, where the uh, uh, urban sites in Europe, where the experience of a highway can uh, uh, be combined with such a real 20th century uh, experience of architecture. And then uh, I want to go again, uh, kind of through a series of steps, again showing this, this trajectory from above to the ground, from the bird's eye view to the worm's eye view, which, which for us uh, kind of finally uh, became the essential way to, uh, the two essential modes of experiencing the park, and also the two essential poles of, uh, of the kind of experience of the park. where really kind of well here it is all program as you descend the the park aspect of it kind of begins to uh, dominate 
and let's say erase some of the, the, the kind of programmatic uh, intensity or hide the programmatic intensity. So it was really at this uh, uh, stage that we were uh, almost confident that we uh, and, and that, uh, that probably also had to do with the, kind of the unbelievable intensity of working uh, on this model and of really establishing every single detail in the model, in the, p the plan, that we were went to the jury rather confidently because we felt that we were probably the only one who could really claim to have designed uh, the park. But uh, to our incredible dismay, we discovered that uh, uh, exactly because we had designed uh, the park, uh, we were mistrusted and uh, there, there was a kind of one uh, extremely eminent uh, uh, member of a jury, uh, supposedly one uh, supporter of ours, who uh, probably gave us the kiss of death in the following uh, words. This uh, is such an incredible work of genius that uh, it has to be executed exactly like it is. Nothing of it may be changed. Uh, uh, when the slightest uh, 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 tempering with it occurs, uh, it, it will not be kind of as beautiful uh, as it is. And, and everybody knows that that kind of argument is really enough to turn any client uh, uh, away and, and, and really to, uh, to lose a competition like this one. In the meantime, something else had happened, which is that uh, the French, the socialist government, after first being committed to an incredible expansion of the economy, uh, decided to uh, uh, revert to a kind of classical austerity and uh, the, the announcement of the austerity program had occurred uh, three days before the presentation to the jury. So uh, in a way, uh, in a kind of very painful way, uh, the jurors were confronted with uh, uh, the earliest impulse of the kind of supposed uh, rejuvenation of socialist culture in France and was now trying to uh, uh, to uh, take an easy way and kind of and was in a way uh, shocked and appalled by to find its uh, ambitions realized in such a uh, drastic way and and looked for ways to uh, to uh, more austere ways of kind of uh, uh, escaping from this dilemma. Anyway, so we lost we lost to uh, Bernard Chumi uh, also a very good uh, project, but just as I described our project in, in uh, the terms of uh, five projects uh, superimposed, uh, his project is really only uh, is really an enlargement of one of our projects, namely the project of the kind of equal distribution of facilities across the site, and where we have uh, five of those grids, he had one. And uh, it's probably kind of a measure of his uh, technical genius that he realized that in a competition you have to be this simple to be uh, understandable and of our, let's say, addiction to architecture that we uh, uh, f uh, forgot about those uh, elementary rules and really indulge ourselves uh, to this extent. Anyway, um, after that uh, we were um, uh, called to Mitra uh, uh, in a kind of private ceremony where he, uh, with uh, three other architects, where he entrusted us the design of Expo uh, as a kind of consolation prize, uh, and where he said that uh, he had been so impressed with our work that uh, it was essential that Paris would benefit from our ideas and that our ideas were maybe not so good for a park, but much better for uh, a world's fair, and uh, that he could offer us two sites in Paris to uh, make a master plan. So uh, it was a real roller coaster experience where first we had almost one level that we lost it and then kind of three weeks later we were possibly in charge of the World's Fair. We did uh, uh, kind of very, uh, we had to do it in two weeks because of course, uh, 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 so we did a very uh, quick scheme which I won't explain uh, kind of in detail and just show a series of uh, drawings. I mean what was very funny, this was the this was the one document that we were given, uh, the site, full of uh, question marks and kind of uh, nonsensical errors of uh, influx and, and uh, outflux. It was a site along the river and 
what was a really a kind of hilarious aspect of it is that the planner so far had conceived a kind of processional visit to the World's Fair where the whole, uh, all visitors would arrive in the morning at the Eiffel Tower, would slowly walk along the river uh, Seine towards the uh, uh, site to arrive en masse uh, at, the, at the main gate and to <laughs> and then to uh, proceed in an orderly fashion to, uh, <laughs> to uh, enjoy the world uh, as a whole in a, a predictable sequence. So first we, we did a series of kind of crazy Anglo-Saxon uh, studies of, uh, how, uh, of, of pragmatic proposals of how a thing like that had to be accessible from all sides and et cetera, et cetera. We built a model where we really kind of proposed not to have pavilions, but where the main thing was that, uh, and that was also in a way to uh, accommodate uh, both poor and rich, the main thing would be that everybody would get, uh, every country would get not so much a site, but a whole territory that he would have to uh, organize according to his own designs. Uh, not necessarily with a building. So a poor country could do a kind of small desert landscape a rich country uh, could do something. And the movement through the kind of uh, exhibition as a whole became uh, just like the, the earth, a movement b between the different uh, territories, kind of poor and rich. So here you see the poor country kind of next uh, to uh, a holographic uh, country, <laughs> an electronic country, etc., etc. So that was the model. And then as a final uh, uh, sign of our, uh, as a final kind of symbol of the um, uh, expo, of course any exposition in Paris is in direct competition with the Eiffel Tower. Uh, I, I don't know whether all of you have seen the Fountainhead, the movie, where the sign of genius is that where all skyscrapers are built uh, like uh, pyramids with the kind of tip uh, on top. The sign of genius is to build an upside down uh, pyramid. So here we also had kind of uh, as a kind of direct uh, to be in competition with the Eiffel Tower, uh, kind of an, an upside down Eiffel Tower of light representing the site. With only friends as a kind of recognizable identity. Anyway, we had been, uh, after two weeks, we presented our, our scheme. Uh, then it took uh, three months to study the different uh, proposals of the uh, other architects as well. Um, in, uh, I think it was June, we were told that we would uh, probably be in charge. And, in, uh, and two weeks later, the whole uh, expo was canceled because of, um, uh, problems in the socialist uh, economy of France. So really, uh, this is uh, uh, just a kind of record of um, one year's experiences uh, with the socialist regime in uh, Paris. Uh, where uh, I don't want to be kind of uh, denigrating about it because I think on the one hand it was incredibly courageous and uh, forward-looking in asking architects to be explicitly progressive and to force them to deal with the uh, issues in a kind of non-historicist uh, terms and to really give programs rather than uh, forms and to insist on, but where uh, this kind of idealism was obviously overtaken by economic realities in the most uh, depressing way. Thank you. Are there questions? I don't know how it goes. Okay, yeah? If there are any questions, I would like to uh, answer them. But maybe then the lights uh, should stay on because otherwise I don't see uh, any. Well, asking the question is answering it. Uh.
No, uh, no, but uh, seriously, uh, I, I am uh, European and uh, I always remained European. I mean, I could say, I mean, it's a question that has uh, many different answers. First of all, uh, of course, I was tempted to uh, to remain in America and to try to become an American architect, but I I have felt very strongly that uh, with airplane pl tickets as cheap uh, as they are, it really was impossible to to generate the whole uh, humorlessness and desperation of an exile that I think is probably necessary to uh, to survive in a, in another society. I mean, that's, that's one important difference, because it worked in cases like Mies and Gropius, but of course they couldn't go back to Europe, and, and the whole operation of going back and forth wasn't as uh, easy and as almost unnoticeable as it is uh, today. Uh, another thing is that uh, it was very clear to me that, uh, uh, because I mean, I, I was at the Institute uh, for, I mean, I could say, I could write a soap opera like I, I was in the institute for six years and, and lived to tell the tale. And uh, that made me very uh, conscious that uh, it w would be very unwise to uh, remain in New York and to compete with New York's, uh, New York's architects uh, uh, on, ab about New York. And that if I was to stay in America, it would be much smarter to go to a place uh, like, for, for example, Miami which uh, seemed possible at some time, and to really become a provincial American uh, and to uh, work, let's say, from the provinces uh, back, uh, which is in a way what I've done uh, now. But anyway, a, a third thing was that uh, I saw American architecture take a certain direction that I didn't feel uh, that much sympathy for, but which I also felt uh, it wasn't really my duty as a European to, to uh, warn against. Uh, and a fourth reason was that uh, I felt that uh, I had learned a lot in America and, and was very excited about uh, uh, certain aspects of American architecture and American urbanism. And that at the same time I saw that uh, Europe was in the grips of a really very uh, conservative uh, architectural movement uh, as embodied by the world as queer. I mean, I don't know whether they've uh, been here. And I, really, I was really very concerned about that because it seemed to foreclose any uh, progressive or exciting ending of the 20th century and really go back to, to an era where all uh, cities are uh, inhabited by glass blowers and, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and people who shoe horses. And uh, so, uh, so, I mean, basically, for this whole complex of reasons, I felt it was more, more exciting and more, uh, more relevant for me to to go there. Yeah. Um. Well, I don't, it, it's not necessarily that uh, I took it into, uh, well, let, let's say, if, if this is the freeway and, and, and this is the scheme, I mean, obviously, the fact that the scheme was organized in this way uh, meant that kind of any movement uh, along the freeway would give you a kind of incredibly uh, quick series of changing landscapes and changing kind of perspectives and changing corridors in which you, in which kind of any one activity would reveal itself, kind of completely, but then become invisible the next uh, second. So, I th I, the way it was organized was really to um, maximize the experience of the freeway in a way that that would make both kind of more exciting, and at the same time there were certain kind of permanent elements or certain large elements, such as the circular forest and the hole that kind of would move. Would, would slowly change kind of relationships as you moved along the freeway. So it was really only on that level that we that we took took it into account. Well, that that was very. I mean, that we were extremely uh, excited about because the freeway was the backdrop of the whole site, and even the the roar of the freeway was kind of very for us a very important uh, given 
because it made the whole thing very, very uh, exciting. And also, in the program, they had asked to create, uh, to use the landscaping to uh, reduce the sound of the freeway. So what everybody did was kind of to implant thick forests uh, on the side of the freeway so that no sound would penetrate the forest and reach the park. But what we did uh, was to essentially accept the inevitable, which was the roar of the freeway, the noise, the urban noise, to exploit it and to kind of make it a, a further experience, but to create kind of at, at regular intervals uh, bunkers of silence in which you go, could go and where you really wouldn't hear anything kind of from the outside uh, world. Uh, sorry, can you repeat it? For a modern architect. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, do you want a serious answer? <laughs> huh? Well, I mean, of course, any movement you're out of sympathy with uh, contains uh, the potential that it. Uh, uh, reveals a certain uh, series of issues that you were insensitive to. I mean, I think that, uh, for instance, the historicists uh, kind of very legitimately have accused modernists of being stupid about many things. And uh, I think that, uh, in that sense, uh, kind of on a on a almost pragmatic level, I would say yes, of course, there is a lesson because now it is possible to be a better modern architect uh, uh, simply because because of their critique you can incorporate your critique in, in, in your own uh, in your own things and otherwise I, will, I, will, I think that kind of as, as we in all our cities maybe not here but uh, in New York and in Europe we see the kind of examples of modernist architect of uh, historicist architecture going up I mean the lessons uh, become more abundant and more uh, for me more uh, joyful uh, every day because I mean it really uh, seems to have universally uh, disastrous consequences. I mean, because I mean, I think that it is possible to to really say that in the name of uh, saving history, they're destroying history. I mean, it, there are now large regions of uh, Europe where it is impossible to see whether a building is new or, or old, except that uh, if you really look well, you see a certain ugliness of the proportions that uh, uh, that probably testifies to its kind of recent. Uh, uh, recent dates or kind of cheapness of uh, materials, but I mean that kind of confusion is is really beginning to uh, to I infuriate uh, more and more people. I mean it's, it's it seems to be definitely kind of in in, in retreat now. Oh, I mean, uh, no, listen, I mean, how am I reifying the present capitalist mode? I mean, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> huh? No, no, what? Yeah, let, he is, yeah. But, uh, okay, I, I mean, I accept the analogy uh, to a certain extent, and also the analogy of supermarket, and, uh, but I, I think the whole difference is, uh, is really, uh, it's a Disneyland without uh, Cinderella, but with, uh, with uh, a kind of botanical garden, or a Disneyland, so uh, I think it, it, is, uh, it, it shows some of the same elements like compression, like a kind of certain entertainment value, it is capable, hopefully, it will be capable of dealing with large numbers. It is addressed to a general audience, etc., etc. But there is a kind of really drastic difference in, in the sense that the facilities, the activities, and, and, and all 
the, the real components of it are absolutely different. So, so, so I think there's an, an, an analogy in terms of model, but a total uh, different difference in terms of contents. And I think that's the important thing. No, I mean, I would never claim to be. Well, I would never claim to be revolutionary because I don't think it's uh, possible for anyone either living in Europe or in America to, to uh, really do that. But, I mean, at the same time, the program, the program itself really established a connection. You know? I mean, they, they spoke of those kind of experiments. And those experiments are very close to, to our work in any case. And I think it's not f not fair to to say it's only formal proximity because I think that it, it really in them also the kind of programmatic aspect that I think is the most uh, inspiring and the most useful uh, still. So um, I I really think that you make too much of the of I mean and and that is something that really uh, is a kind of very common thing with people who conf accuse us of formalism uh, ultimately. Because they ignore the, the all the other aspects that uh, I've been kind of emphasizing rather exhaustively, kind of in this whole uh, presentation, I think, and and they concentrate on kind of those tiny specks of form that are visible. Because I mean, if you take the formalism of, or if you take the forms, I mean, they're kind of like tiny dots uh, in the total landscape. So I, I think you shouldn't uh, really attach too much importance to them. Then. So to a certain I mean, isn't that uh, okay? I know. Uh, no, because I mean, what, what I was, what I was, uh, what I was explaining is not the kind of theory that I have. But I mean, what I was uh, uh, trying to explain in the kind of uh, n most naked possible way is the way we worked on a project. You know, because I think that in this, because there, there are projects that are gladly explained as a kind of ideological statement on my part or a kind of theoretical statement. But what was interesting here is, uh, at least for me, was how we achieved a certain result. And uh, I would say that the result is the model by, uh, in a very kind of, in a way full of mistakes, or in a, in a kind of trajectory full of mistakes. I think the mistakes were typical and were uh, illuminating. You know, and the mistake is that, that architects, because they're architects, first, their first instinct is to architecturize. And that in this case, that was really uh, uh, very dumb, and that the whole thing could really be only, finally only controlled by a series of uh, much more intellectual steps. As real? 
Well, what do you mean? I, I didn't keep referring to it as real. When? Oh, uh, I mean, uh, no, has no significance. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, just uh, leave it out. Uh, well, I mean, first of all, I thought that, uh, I mean, I now think that the two are very close uh, together. And, and I think that in the scheme, you can also see the, the closeness of it. Because, I mean, for me, there's really almost no difference between uh, uh, establishing a plot and creating, uh, uh, creating a kind of sequence of different uh, episodes in a story than there is between uh, composing different episodes of program in such a way that they start to uh, make sense or that more happens than in the individual uh, elements that you put together. And uh, so, I mean, I, I, I mean, the more I, I do architecture, the more I realize that the, the it's really the one, one and the same activity, which is finally, let's say, whether you manipulate actors or uh, and, uh, uh, <laughs> and I, I don't really know what made the uh, why I changed, but but. Um, I mean, m maybe just the fact that uh, that uh, to be a scriptwriter at uh, 55 seemed uh, like being uh, a Rolling Stone at 55, I mean, and uh, and architects, uh, I mean, uh, are notoriously it's a good uh, profession to uh, get old in. <laughs> but, Okay, well, I'll draw again. I mean, there's this uh, thing, you know, so, th so there's no connection there. Yeah? Uh, it's only a visual connection. And uh, then here there's a canal. Uh, so that is also a rather strong separation. But I mean, there's a series of bridges, nevertheless. So basically what it is, there, there's a boulevard, and the, two bu the boulevard has a, a, a gate or an entrance on the two sides of the city that, that become the kind of the major collectors of the whole uh, of the uh, audience in the park and, and they, they're also uh, because it had to be part of it had to be 24 hour and part of it had to be uh, closed off at certain times so the boulevard is also the, the kind of one element that organizes the whole distribution uh, in the park so therefore it is not really a park that you filter in from all sides but it, it through a mixture of, of the kind of demands and a mixture of the context it, it became almost inevitable to have a, a major entrance on, on both sides, which is kind of modified by a series of secondary uh, elements. But I mean, you saw maybe in the model also things going over the uh, highway, over the canal, so, that, so the, there were all kinds of tentacles reaching into different parts of the city. Sorry, can you, can you repeat it? No. Yeah, the whole. Yeah. 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 You mean that, that the, the kind of flexibility of all, the defect of flexibility of all these uh, types proves that uh, you might as well be very typological. 
Huh? No, it doesn't hinder, no. no but I think that it, it doesn't hinder in America because in America the respect is less uh, obsessive. I mean, uh, uh, I, mean I, I, I still don't know a single uh, church in Europe that is turned into a condominium, but I mean, apparently, <laughs> no, but apparently here, it, here it happens. And so I think that uh, first, that as another thing is that kind of the, the, the places that are most converted here are in themselves uh, extremely uh, flexible and, um, let's say, indeterminate uh, spaces to begin with, and always were, like loft buildings, uh, f factories, or, and, and, and the like. You know, so I think that there were the whole idea of that kind of flexibility, which is typically American, in itself lends itself uh, for a kind of perpetual conversion, because you could almost say that no uh, no one occupancy is more legitimate uh, than another in in many of these American buildings. Well, I think that. It is not so much limiting. I, I, I mean, I've always uh, known that you know that you could, that any activity could be insinuated in any building. But uh, so I, I don't think that that is the the real limitation. But what I think is limiting is to try to uh, uh, try to uh, borrow for every cultural activity a type, an architectural type, from the past. So it's it's not really the fact that actual activities uh, invade actual buildings but really that models are imposed on activities from models from the past. And then they, they are obviously much, much less flexible because they are models, and therefore they have to retain a kind of purity to, to be recognizable. We have an office uh, that that really works uh, in 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 a very uh, let's say almost uh, uh, how can I put this uh, at its most uh, correct. Anyway, it's, it's really a very a real group enterprise, huh? and uh, on this project have worked um, I would say five people very intensely. And uh, at the, the time we were working on the model, uh, most intensely, uh, I think something like 25 uh, people. And so what really happens on, on work project like this one is that all our offices together work in a single uh, place. I mean, so on this project worked uh, two Americans, one Italian, two Greeks, four Dutch. So it, in that sense, it's kind of really very, uh, yeah. No, not international, but, but it really, I mean, the contributions are very recognizable of, of, of this kind. No, you saw you saw that there were a lot of sketches. Right? I mean, so really, we we uh, there we generated a kind of an, an incredible ocean of sketches, and it really was very difficult to uh, to compress it ultimately to kind of a single drawing. So that that black drawing was a kind of triumph of of control over that uh, incredible uh, mass. But really, we all sketch. Uh, we all have A3 sketchbooks, and, and that's how it works. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.